In this talk, Nemanja Gojković, who is a self-proclaimed electri electrical engineer turned salesman, then turned data scientist, turned consultant, uh, he prefers engineering pragmatism over academic exactness. His talk will focus more on what algorithm porn is, what are its causes and what costs do we pay for it, both short and long term. Conversely, how do we mitigate it and stick to the simplicity first approach while preventing mutiny and chum among our data scientists and engineers? So without any further ado, I would like you to give a round of applause for Nemanja. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, thank you all for coming. I understand it's a bit, it's a bit late. It's the last, one of the last sessions, so thanks for coming. So, uh, how do we start a talk with, uh, with porn in the title? Okay, so for, first of all, uh, I have to disappoint. I have to disappoint many of you. This is the worst clickbait title you have seen in this conference, uh, which was made just to lure you in. Uh, it's completely kosher. There are no juicy details or juicy uh, content. There are some movie references, but not that kind. Um, so uh, you still have time to leave. Huh? So <laughs> if somebody came just because of that. Huh? Uh, if not, uh, let's, let's get it going. Okay, so just, just briefly uh, about me. So my current title is Senior Consultant at Deloitte Belgium. Uh, what I actually do is a blend of data science and machine learning. So I'm uh, I'm basically doing both the prototyping of uh, machine learning models and deploying them uh, in production. Not at a large scale still, but uh, let's say that I, I work on the, on the whole pipeline. Uh, and um, so D Deloitte, most people, and even me included before I joined, uh, know it uh, for its tax practice, the audit, the legal, and so forth. But many people don't know that the Deloitte is one of the top players in the domain of tech consulting. And also together with the growth of um, of the whole AI field, uh, our AI practice, uh, advanced analytics, is also growing very rapidly. Um, so, from the experience of previous years, projects uh, across various industries, across various clients, uh, we have noticed certain patterns, it's better to say anti-patterns, uh, in uh, which lead to certain inefficiencies uh, in our projects, uh, which we, in, in our canteen uh, over there, yeah, we see the planes. Uh, you know, we dubbed the uh, algorithm porn. So, um, huh? so what is what is for us at least uh, algorithm porn? Um, it's any kind of development, any kind of uh, inflation of project or product features, which are not really driven by by client demands or project demands, but more like, let's say, satisfying the ego of the developer uh, or just uh, how they call it, I like the term, uh, a resume-driven development. Huh? So when you're just applying something just so that you can, in the end, uh, show it off somewhere. Of course, sometimes you want that, sometimes the clients get impressed by that, but most often it really leads to uh, some negative consequences down the, down the line. Um, we're not the only ones who had came up with this. I, I found, I Googled and I found an topic, an article on this topic, a guy with the exact same term, which was talking about the exact same problem. As, as you can see, he's also asking the same question. Is this, uh, is this bringing us any progress? All this uh, one-upmanship and all this uh, um, endless competing on some academic data sets or applying some uh, nukes in, in the algorithm shape on, on various data sets, torturing the data until they confess everything. Or is yeah? Is there is there any is, is it any worth? Let's let's call it like that. Uh, is this thing working? Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, we're also trying to think. Of course, first, in order to solve a problem, you need to understand why is it happening, uh, and what we believe, what I believe, I just say, <laughs> is that uh, it lies. It's in a it's in a way in the nature of a data scientist uh, to be a pioneer, huh? so to be a person which is inspired by novelty and to um, to rush into the unknown and bring a bag of gold or something, you know, to, to bring some value. And uh, they just feel depressed a bit if, if they walk down the beaten path. That's, that's not just something that excites them where they feel uh, at home. They get restless if, if this goes on forever. Uh, also, I think we are putting a bit of uh, pressure on data scientists today, the industry and the society. We expect data scientists to uh, make self-driving cars, send people to the moon, uh, cure cancer, bring world peace and so forth. And uh, maybe there is a it's a hypothesis uh, that we feel uh, that 
in order to bring something big, we need in a way to, to suffer. Huh? We need to make something complicated. We need uh, to, to shed tears over our algorithm, uh, I don't know, kneeling on, on, on rice or whatever, huh? and people reading our code should also cry. Um, I don't know if they think that, but uh, certainly a lot of code looks as if people had this uh, belief while, while producing it. Uh, but some, somebody would say, okay, if there's just like a lot of good to haves uh, next to the must haves, is it uh, really that bad? Maybe it's just like a benign phenomenon, maybe, maybe there's not. But uh, actually, we have seen over and over again that uh, down the line, yeah, it's a, it's a killer, huh? So algorithm porn, yeah, it's uh, exciting, uh, tempting in the short term, but in the long term, never good. It kills your time, it kills your money, which leads to uh, failed projects, which leads to failed products. And uh, the last and the worst thing I would say, it leads to failed, uh, failed relationships between clients and vendors, uh, between employees and employers, uh, and so forth. Huh? Th that's enough, I would say. Huh? So uh, the question is, it, it's, it's a bit hard to catch huh? when, when you're actually uh, deviating into, into this trajectory. So, so what can we really do about it? You know, if you're, if you're a software engineer, I'm not saying it's easy, huh? uh, but uh, at least you have some tests which fail and then you know you have a problem. Uh, in data science, you know that you can, everything can pass and function, but you have a terrible analysis and then uh, it can keep you awake at night, at night and so forth. Uh, what we indeed can do about it, in the simplest form is we need to understand the whole data science process. We need to study it thoroughly. We need to simplify upstream as much as we can and then we need to repeat it. Okay, uh, easier said than done. Uh, this, this is a model I will use for this, like a tracker for this presentation. Are you aware of the CRISP DM model? Does somebody know what's a CRISP? Oh, okay, good, okay. More of you should learn about it. <laughs> Google it. Uh, so it's a cross industry standard process for data. data. It's not the best for data mining. It's not the best one, but it's, it's good enough. And it shows a good overview of, of what we do, including deployment. Many times we f people forget about deployment. Huh? Uh, and if you're developing anything worthwhile, you should go to deployment finally. Okay, so, um, yeah, I just changed. Not, not understand the data because you first need to collect it. Okay, and um, let's go block by block and see what can we do to uh, minimize these uh, creative deviations uh, on the road to creating really good, stable data products. Uh, you need to start with a domain uh, understanding. So, no, first you need to start with a, with a problem. Huh? So people sometimes start from the availability of data, which you know is just a road to hell. Um, you need to understand when you, assuming you have defined your problem, you need to understand the broader picture, the domain, huh? that's clear. You need to understand that specific problem more in details. And this is all important in order for you to be able to define the scope properly at the very beginning of your project. Um, scope creep. Is, is a familiar term all over software engineering. Uh, and the, the basic challenge is how to define what are the must-haves uh, versus what are the good-to-haves. And this is uh, something which is often challenging and there are conflicting opinions. So, of course, it's important who says it's a must-have, who says it's a good-to-have, uh, and what is the impact. Some, sometimes when you analyze the impact, you realize, okay, it's, it's not a must-have. We, we can wait with that feature. Huh? Um, when collecting the data, uh, again, we should, we should try in a way to minimize the effort, at least, at least in the early stages. So listen to the domain experts. If they tell you that something is, uh, is nonsense and should not be included in the, in the modeling, then trust them with a grain of salt because sometimes they don't know what you can do with the algorithm. So be brave enough to listen to them, but also brave enough to, uh, to challenge them, of course. Uh, the second point is, uh, I, I would need bigger, a bigger bold font, I, I should have done that, but carefully design the collection process. What I mean by this, um, okay, if you're in the field of structured data, there's not a lot of space for you to really change something in collecting, not often. Huh? So if you're, you're trying, if you need them to disturb some HR process or a sales process in order for you to collect more data, it's sometimes a deal breaker. Uh, but if you're, if you're working with computer vision, if you're working in IoT, uh, let's say, working with a, with, a, with a physical world in a way, where you're measuring, uh, measuring some signals, there, is a million, there are a million ways in which you can place your sensors, place a camera, uh, just, just by switching something, you can reduce the order of complexity uh, significantly for your whole 
for your whole product and your whole project and eliminating the need, for example, for deep learning down the line and yeah, just sticking with uh, some linear model or a random forest or something like that. Um, mind the volume, of course. So we really live in a world of, uh, of the buzzword called the big data. And uh, I think everybody's feeling has this fear of missing out if they're not working on the big data. Uh, but I would say it's good to have it somewhere. But if there's not a really big need for you to use uh, big data, don't use it. I mean, if, if you have learned some statistics, you know that you can take a representative sample. So if you take a smaller sample instead of a terabyte or a petabyte, if you can work with a gigabyte, which represents the whole properly, um, you will have when you go to deployment, you'll have uh, shorter training cycles, shorter scoring cycles, uh, you'll have uh, lower costs of storage, lower cost of networking, and so forth. So you can understand how uh, being a bit sloppy there can, can easily escalate and cost you in the end. Both the time and the uh, iterations are, are actually very important, how, how quickly we do that. Um, so now let's say you have collected everything. Now, now you're moving inside the box of, of your computer. So this all before was in a way you still did not touch the code, presumably. Uh, use as much as you can use, I would say, use the libraries uh, that, that exist already and try to find, the, the second point is, is more important here. Um, when you read tutorials, let's say, so first time I did a text mining, a text classification algorithm, all the tutorials uh, will, if you're not doing the, some deep learning model, will recommend to vectorize your text using something called a TF-IDF vectorizer. I think 90% of, of 99% of tutorials today available will recommend using that specific one. It's an industry standard and so forth. And so that's what we started with in our project. We had a, a performance of, let's say, around 80%. And then just by saying, okay, let's try to do something simpler. Not, not go to, to a complex solution. Let's, start, let's go a step below. You use with scikit-learn's text processing uh, function called count vectorizer, which is something you can all write in, in like 15 minutes to half an hour, I would say. We raised our performance from 80 to, let's say, like 92, 93%, which can be the difference between something being usable and, and being unusable, for example. And there are some other, within the count vectorizer, going from the standard tutorial uh, level of parameters going a step down, which gave us even a, a stronger improvement. For example, not just to, to keep stay too much in this, but using instead of using the word tokenization, we used character tokenization, which turned out to be much more robust to typos. And then we didn't need uh, any kind of uh, spell checking and, and whatever. So the, the algorithm turned out to be very robust by turning it a couple of steps uh, down. Okay, so now we get into the domain of the modeling. This is where, where most of the magic happens, where we, we put so much uh, attention today on, on, as we said, on making these fancier algorithms. Uh, there's a number of studies which have shown on an array of uh, data sets that there's a very small number of use cases where, where actually the algorithm wins over, I would say, data quality and data prep and feature engineering. Huh? Uh, so one of the first practices you should use, uh, I assume many are aware, but sometimes we forget, use a baseline model. Uh, do you know what's a baseline model? How many people know what's a baseline model? Okay, so we need to say that. Uh, baseline model is basically like a very simple heuristic. It's like a rule. So let's say you're doing time series forecasting and you say, I will assume, just make a stupid assumption that to tomorrow my sales will be like today. It's a very stupid assumption, but maybe it will be like something similar. And then all the models you develop from there on should beat that model. And if you don't beat this very simple and stupid assumption, then you, I don't know, throw your computer in the trash and there's no, then use, use your baseline. Um, start with linear models. Of course, this is all or also mantra, uh, but we forget and we should keep that, I don't know, tattooed somewhere or something. So we, we should always start with that. They're interpretable, they're fast. Uh, avoid deep learning. Okay, I, I would have maybe have to hide behind this. I hope nobody shoots at me because of this at a data science conference. But really, unless there is a really strong justification for you to use deep learning, I would say avoid it in any way that you can. Um, if this, there's tabular data, if you have structured tabular data, there, there's no sense in, in using that. Huh? So uh, yeah, it's, it's something like this. Huh? So uh, just <laughs> not compatible, huh? okay? Uh, if, if, there is, if there is really a need uh, for you to, uh, to, use some, to do some kind of uh, computer vision, text mining, don't jump to downloading, installing TensorFlow, PyTorch, whatever, and running a cluster or whatever you think of. 
there are nice API services. It's really not expensive. You, there was a talk here uh, from Microsoft about the Microsoft Custom Vision. It, it, if I knew about this Microsoft Custom Vision two weeks ago, uh, I would save some big money for my company. I did, just didn't know about it. Huh? So uh, that's another point we need to keep, uh, keep in touch with what are the latest developments. Google Vision, Amazon Comprehensive for text mining. Uh, and finally, if it's unavoidable for you to, in the end, use deep learning, uh, use existing topologies, uh, you may, you're all probably very smart, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> it takes time even for smart people to develop really something innovative in, in the domain of deep learning. And there are a couple of research groups which do that. And most of us just use the tools they are developing the algorithm. So use existing topologies like recently we used for a project, uh, the YOLO uh, algorithm. I don't know if somebody heard of it. It's for, for object localization. It works very nice out of, out of the box. You clone it to your, to your hard drive. You label the data. And, and, and you run it and it works fine, and use pre-trained models, meaning pre-trained weights, and apply uh, the transfer learning whenever possible. Saving time, saving money, and then later, if, if you have managed to prove the concept uh, with this approach, then you can think if there's really some marginal in increment needed, uh, then you can go that way. Okay, um, evaluation. So this is something which, of course, Having a target metric is something you also define at the very beginning. And the target metric, um, if it's not, it needs to be not only clear, but it needs to be clearly linked with the, with the business question. And it's a constant, it's like a, how should I say, like a guiding star. The business problem is the cornerstone and your metric is the guiding star uh, against which you evaluate all your models uh, in the future. And uh, when you want to balance too many things, in the end you fail. So the, the advice is use a single metric and if you need to use multiple metrics, still say one will be the optimization metrics, the rest will be the so-called thresholding or satisficing metrics, how some people call them. So what's the logic? You would just say, let's say you have 10 competing models, you will say, I want the winner of this competition will be the one with uh, maximum precision, but in the pool I will have only the ones which uh, have recall of at least 80%. Uh, so if none of them cross the threshold, then I don't know, back to the drawing board or something. Then you, then you have a different problem. Um, okay, I believe this is clear. Uh, and finally, you get, you're all happy, you, you did everything nice and, and simple and minimal uh, with a minimum necessary force uh, to tackle your, your data problem. And then you go to deployment. Again, don't start buying clusters and, and, and you know, building buildings and, and whatnot. Huh? First, and even infrastructure as a service can be an overkill and, and just waste a lot of your time. Platform as a service uh, providers, AWS, Google App Engine, uh, AWS Elastic Beanstalk is a very good one, very easy to, to work with, to deploy, update, and so forth. And try containers. I say try because I cannot guarantee for them. Uh, it's a funny thing. Uh, Deloitte's internal global IT uh, protocols on firewall prevent us from using uh, Docker. So, uh, yeah, I could not play around with it a lot. Uh, but from from all the places I could read it, I understand it allows you to have a really nice bumpless transfer from uh, development to, to production. And as well uh, to have a certain kind of a bubble which can then be copied between the developers and so that everybody is nice and happy without any things breaking in different environments. So um, that's, that's for us the end of the, the pipeline. As just as a bonus uh, here, we, I would like to talk a bit about the process. Uh, there should definitely be a standard process. It's a very good practice. I mean, not, yeah, nobody can force you to use it, but it's always good for you uh, to have a standard process that you are following, that everybody in the team is following. You know, if you're a one-man show, then it make, doesn't make a really big difference. But if your team has three, four, five people already, uh, it's, uh, it's very necessary, it's very practical, and, and uh, saves you uh, nerves and trouble. Uh, checklists. Uh, it's, it sounds very stupid, but checklists are fantastic and amazing things. Uh, and um, there was some kind of research in, in, in hospitals that uh, hospitals which use just checklists that just that the surgeon before the surgery and after the surgery just needs to check some things. Oh, I didn't leave the, the scalpel in the person and I, I, I saw this. Uh, nah, nah, nah. But if they just do all these things uh, with a simple checklist, uh, checklist uh, the, the incidence of uh, this post-operative uh, problems, infections and so forth is reduced by... I don't know, 20, 30 percent, which is which is quite significant. Uh, and finally, we, we are 
maybe we are fighting this, but we are a flavor of software engineers. Huh? Uh, not, not as good, but we should. the better software engineers you are, the better data scientists you will be. So I would urge anybody with any aspirations to stay in this field. I think we will have to learn much more about this. Uh, follow coding and documentation standards. Learn about use everyday version control, test-driven development as much as you can. CI, CD, OK, when you get to the, to the deployment, uh, this whole DevOps tooling and process. And uh, standardized project structure across the team. This is something we're implementing currently because, um, yeah, in other programming languages, it's like normal that you, if you start like a Node.js project, there's bam, there's immediately certain kind of project structure or Rails or Java. Uh, in Python, it's, it's a bit more freestyle, but there's this cool thing called cookie cutter, which gives you a lot of, uh, it's, it's like you, you just start create a new project and there are different templates for different kinds of projects. And there is a cookie cutter for data science template. And if you use this within your team, this will really allow you to, to have a standard way. Uh, it's interchangeable, so when you, yeah, you just look at another person's code and you don't have to suffer, you know where the Jupyter notebooks are, where the raw data is, where the transform data is, uh, and where the, yeah, the, the processing and everything is. It makes things very, very simple. And uh, yeah, it just takes up a couple of lines of code to set it up, and, and that's it. And reminding people to use it. <laughs> uh, Good. So in terms of process, so just, just as a summary of this first step where we're still talking about how to put a lid, how to <laughs> yeah, crush the dreams of aspiring data scientists and keep things simple, uh, set up processes, standards, and tools, uh, diligently keep up to date with existing packages and services. This is potentially the biggest time saver. Huh? There are so many people that the community is so big and most of our problems, 99% of them, somebody already had and people are making these packages and libraries and vendors are making solutions, like we saw the ones, the APIs for, for model deployment, which are very uh, affordable, I would say, and convenient to use, and you, you don't have to deal, deal with it. They guarantee for the uptime and everything. You just need to integrate it in your, in your data application. Um, and the last one, simplicity upstream pays dividends downstream. Huh? So you should always try to uh, invest as much as you can to really carefully see what can you uh, what can you simplify in this before you get to to your so think outside the box where the box is your your computer or your server or whatever and think about what how can you simplify the problem before it even enters enters the machine huh? so uh, so let's say okay let's say you did all of this and now you have your lean mean simple functioning algorithm what if we succeed so what's a potential problem there? And, and it's a real problem. Uh, it's something that, that you encounter. It's like uh, this make, all of these previous things make seniors happy, like they're already battle-tested and everything. Uh, <laughs> but it makes, uh, it, makes, it makes juniors a bit unhappy. I mean, hope, hopefully not, not leading to this scenario, uh, but often leading to this scenario. You see, you have, you have a lot of juniors coming out from, from universities with very high hopes and expectations, uh, dreams, and they want to jump into the deep learning. They heard data science is the sexiest uh, job, uh, which is like, <laughs> yeah. And was that data? Uh, <laughs> did any data scientists try to replicate uh, that study? I don't know, huh? I, I would be curious to know. Uh, but basically, okay, we need to do something about it, huh? Because if you, if you just, tell your juniors, no, you need, just need to use the, the linear regression all the time and, and use the if-else, and he's like, but we can use this and that. They get frustrated, they get restless, and, and uh, you have big churn among your, among your juniors. So there are ways, of course, uh, you need to invest. Huh? So if, if you want them to work 100% of time on the projects and do only what's needed for the project, that maybe will not work. You need to you need to set aside some kind of a budget and some kind of time for their training, for their to, to allow them to follow some kind of uh, certification tracks, which will keep them inspired. Send them to nice conferences like this one or somewhere else in the world. It's not all so expensive. I went to PyData Berlin. It was dirt cheap, really. But it, it was, uh, yeah, it was like a high school event or something like that, okay? Uh, <laughs> the value corresponded with the quality. Uh, but, um, <laughs> and... <laughs> 
<laughs> and finally, not to the talks. The talks were great. Uh, yeah, so yeah, cut out this. Yeah. <laughs> Don't go public with this thing. Yeah, they will ban me from the conference. Uh, and so, uh, and and finally, allow them to do some kind of um, proof of concept project. So make let them do some kind of moonshot projects where they don't have to bring some crazy value to you or the or the client. Of course, you, do, you will not let them work nine months on this, but give them give them a couple of weeks to try out uh, try out certain algorithms because. Most likely, although you don't always need these complex algorithms, there will probably probably be a time when, when you will need it. Huh? And then you need to be ready. So you need to, in a way, sharpen the ax uh, in, in this way huh? and, and be ready for these things. And finally, hopefully, you have a very happy junior. Everybody's happy. You have your, your foundation. And, and the point is, I mean, the point of all of this is, uh, is really how to make... Um, quality, so reliable, uh, performant uh, projects and products which are delivered on time, uh, which are delivered uh, within the budget, uh, where people are not burned out or stressed out. And yeah, in the end, that everybody, everybody seems to be happy. I am done on time. Yeah. Thank you. These are just some links. It's not important. And you have the Q&A. Okay. That Let's is shoot. that as well, but that is quite <laughs> a, <laughs> uh, quite an achievement. Uh, reminder: you can ask your questions via the link here. So it's dsc.network forward slash capital Q capital A forward slash Tesla with a capital T, and cap sizes do matter. <laughs> oh yeah, that's why it didn't work for me. Bad programming. Alas. Um, <laughs> we do have some questions, though, here already. Okay. So um, how do you argue against the future-proofing argument uh, when planning, designing features uh, in order to avoid algorithm pool, as it was said? Can the uh, asker of this question clarify the question uh, with the future-proofing? Uh, yeah, of Who course. Who asked the question? Uh, if you can stand up, please. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, that's, so when a colleague says we need to do this advanced algorithm in order to make our code more future-proof for future development, for future advances, how do you argue against that? Where the question is, uh, is that just like uh, wishful thinking? Is it grounded in reality? I mean, it's, it will always be an argument, huh? Yeah, it might be. Of course, and there, there are cases where where we are in a way uh, using still, we, I, I did a project where I used deep learning, although we, the client asked us, he said, you, we want you to use deep learning. We said, you don't need deep learning. He said, you, I, we want you to use deep learning because there are sometimes like politics. So you have people with budgets uh, on high positions in companies which say, which want to have in their CV, in their annual report or something uh, that they are using innovative technologies, you know? And then you just do it, You're, he's just burning this money for that, and, and you, you just, okay, you go along, whatever, you didn't hurt anybody. But uh, it's, it's, an, it's a discussion, huh? it's, it's sometimes, yeah, if you, 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 can, you cannot always win, but you should challenge, huh? I would say it should be in a way not just hunch-based, you know, but uh, of course not everything can be data-based, that's not a problem. So, uh, yeah, challenge, I would say just challenge and see what's the impact, huh? If you say, let's do this, and if this takes a year, and so what's, what's the priority? Huh? That there needs to be a priority matrix, and that you can sort all these things out. Huh? Yeah. Thanks. Speaking of uh, challenging, you mentioned here the deep learning and not to use it. So how do you respond to clients when they want to use deep learning, and you clearly see there's no need for it, and they're, they're insistent? So, so uh, Deloitte's philosophy is to always try to advise the client if we think that he's wrong. Uh, because we are, we want, we want, we think this is a, this is a good client, uh, relationship. Uh, and of course, in the end, he, he's the boss. If he really insists, we will, I mean, he's, he's informed. We make sure that he's informed that this is not the best practice. If he still sticks with it, I mean, yeah, it's not a nuclear bomb. So what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so what is the main difference between internal data science projects and data science projects as a professional service for your customers? Within Deloitte, yeah. is the question. Uh, <laughs> the main difference is, um, I would say, 
external projects have a nice budget, have good management, and they get finished on time. <laughs> Internal projects get dragged along uh, for, uh, for ages. Yeah, because uh, it's something we do on top of everything else. So it's basically our free time. Yeah. Uh, could you share with us uh, a story of your cha more challenging projects that you did in terms of... In terms of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ex external... Uh, in in terms sorry. of technology? Yeah. In terms of technology. Uh, well, the most challenging thing I did was making a text classification algorithm. This is a product we're developing now. Uh, it's used for... Um, so whenever goods are traveling over the border, uh, they need to have a certain... It's called an HS code for the customs, which defines the customs duties that you paid on these goods. And um, it's a really complex problem, which requires domain knowledge and product knowledge. And um, it's something which has very high volumes. And for companies which have billions of trade over the world, it creates big risks if they do this classification wrong. And in this classification, they have a lot of churn with them. For, it's done manually mainly now, huh? so we're, we're automating this process. So this involved building uh, this uh, natural language processing uh, text mining uh, model from scratch up to deploying it now on, on AWS. Yeah, so for me, this was the most interesting. 